Good evening, Don't Unfriend Me Nation. My name is Matthew Spear. I'm the host of Don't Unfriend Me. Good to have you here. Thanks for stopping by. What are we going to talk about tonight? Well, we do what we usually do and take some topics and try to present a side that, you know, is fairly balanced, maybe not in political ideology, because obviously I'm, I'm a conservative and, and Republican, eh, more conservative and moderate at the same time. I know that doesn't necessarily make, make much sense, but either does the, the range of our political parties now. Uh, the left is no longer left. They're no longer liberal. Conservatives are the farthest thing from conservatives. And, and really, we have a mishmash of deciding where you stand fiscally, where you stand fundamentally, um, and where you stand from a global perspective. And I guess I could say I'm fairly moderate on most things. However, my default is to be conservative uh, when it comes to do we need more government or not? And the answer is no. Let the states kind of work things out. And and this is a topic that I spent a couple hours on trying to write something that wasn't prescriptive or prosthetic. And a lot of people will say, well, Matt, that's not the way you are. You may be a little mundane in your presentation style, and it might be, you know, a little bit of drudgery and then some some sludging through the trough. And then it gets to this climactic catalyst where everything makes sense. And that's usually the way my shows are. But this this will be more from just straight off the cusp, more like our live shows, but but really trying to uh, be as honest as I can. This topic is is not easy. And my loyalties are divided here because the one thing when you're a purveyor of history and causation and, you, and you've studied patterns in order to make predictive analysis or an educated decision on what's coming, and especially in this job, whether I was working in retail or the military, working in Intel, whatever it was, those things were paramount. But here, more than anything is if you make a call that isn't accurate, you're going to lose viewers. And you lose viewers, then there really is no point doing this. And I'm well aware that I have crossed that line several times where I've lost viewers because of my stance. And that's never my concern. What I don't want to do is lose viewers because I'm being misinterpreted. So being very deliberate with what I say here and saying I've looked at this from all different angles. As a very young boy... My mother and father were not necessarily the most nurturing of people. They were fairly narcissistic. Uh, I wonder where I get that from, um, as we all can be at some point. But they were very concerned with keeping up with the Joneses and, and what could they do to um, constantly develop themselves in their work, never being satisfied, never being happy, never looking around themselves and realizing that that maybe living beyond our means wasn't the focus that we should have tried to pull back because we went through some hardships, you know, three years with no carpet in our house because the water heater flooded and ruined all the carpet. And we're, we're walking around on concrete and, and recognizing that my mom went through brain surgery and put my dad in a position where he had to work three jobs. And, and although I say narcissistic, uh, when it came to where they stood in life, not so much when it came to making sacrifices for the kids, which always seemed to come first. So we have to tip our hat, at least I do, to my parents for that. But it reminds me of a time when my mom was working at B. Dalton Bookseller, and she was always so proud. And if you remember B. Dalton, it was before Barnes & Noble, and it was ultimately bought out. But B. Dalton was predominantly in malls, and they would have like a, their own little Macy's Day window where the latest book would be coming out, whether it be Tom Clancy or... Uh, some sort of love romance novel where the managers were responsible for getting a budget, probably like 50 bucks. And back then that was a lot of money to go to the local five and dime and create these windows that were magnificent. And if it was a, a rendition of 34th on a miracle on 34th street or something, they'd do a Christmas scene. If it was a romance novel, they would put sand and seashells. Well, my mother was amazing at doing these. And there was another gentleman that helped my mother do them. And his name was Kent. And Kent was a young man who was on his mission, and he was in California, and he was from Utah, obviously, and he was a Mormon, Latter-day Saint, and was just a diminutive, small-statured human being. Um, I would say in the range of 5'7", five, 5'8", five, maybe a buck twenty, soaking wet, but had a soft appearance, 
um, had a very soft-spoken way about him and someone who you instantly liked. And I, and I certainly did. And I was young at the time. I, I must have been no more than eight or nine years old. But when you grow up with a Marine Corps father, there are stereotypes in the house. And whether it be about color or religion or sexual orientation, yes, even back then, there was a very strong sense of disrespect to the homosexual community, at least from today's standards. It wasn't a vile hatred. It was a lack of understanding and almost a level of disgust because the feelings that we all get when when younger children see it now don't necessarily find it strange because they're inundated with it at a young age. It's in the movies. It's being talked about in school. We understand these things. But back then, it, it wasn't. It was very foreign and, and very similar to the days that um, a black actor kissed a white woman, Sidney Poitier, Sidney Poitier, for the first time on uh, a movie and then happened on TV as well. It, it was a shock to the people. And, and in a society that had a lot of bigotry and prejudices, it, it created some unease. And this had happened with the LGBTQ community when I was growing up. And it was in the front of the news all the time. And this was more of the LGB community at this point. And with Ronald Reagan and AIDS and there was a, you know, Matt Shepard and the beating of Matt Shepard and, and all of the, the jokes and the misnomers and the disrespect, it was serious and it was dark and it was not like it is today where a lot of this is microcosms of maybe some leftover prejudice or bigotry or lines that are being crossed into areas where the the shoe is on the other foot, so to speak. And I'll go into that more later. But Kent was a soft-spoken person, like I said, and, and whether he was homosexual or not, I, I have no idea. In fact, this was never discussed with me um, because there was no reason for me to know. V very similar to with my children now, I, I, I don't feel I need to have that conversation with them. A uh, quick sub story at 10 years old, my daughter came up to me and she said, well, I'm questioning some things about my sexuality. And I said, great, we'll talk about it when you're 16. You don't need to talk about this now. In fact, we should be worried about where you're going to go play, what sports you're going to do, what's coming on TV, what movie you're going to. Let's put it to bed. We'll talk about it in a while. And if you feel you need to have a conversation, that's fine. But we don't need to figure this out right now. And she said, sure. And then two years later, she came to me and said, hey, dad, guess what? I like boys. And I looked at her and I said, great, we don't need to be talking about this now. Let's wait till you're 16. Go ahead and go to the mall. Go watch movies, listen to music, and we can discuss this later. And if you need to talk about it, we will. But for now, let's just go ahead and be a kid. That was very much the way it was back then, too. And it is for a lot of families. The reason I brought up Kent is because he was a family friend and worked with my mom. And my mom obviously saw things in Kent that she didn't see in her other children. And, and that's ultimately the way my mom was, always looking over the fence at who she could rise up and, and, and compete with. But she would bring Kent over, and he was always so kind to me and always so nice to me. And he would talk to me, and we would joke around. And he treated me not like an eight- or nine-year-old kid, but a, a little adult. And, I, and I, I loved the guy. He was great. But one day... My father, being a jealous father, and always was, would say things that were so head-scratching, and you would wonder why he was saying them. One day, Kent had left the house, and when he did, my dad simply said, he's an effing fag. Now, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't understand it, but what I did understand is that the F word was used uh, predominantly in the house, and where I came from, mother was half of a word. But the other portion of the word I didn't understand, and I didn't ask, but I knew it was derogatory, and I knew it had to do something with Kent's disposition and his personality and betrayal of himself. So a couple days later, Kent had come over, and I had asked my mom, could I go uh, to the mall with Kent? Because Kent had asked, you want to go to the mall? We'll go get an Orange Julius or go get a, uh, a famous Dave cookie or whatever it is. And, and my comment was, absolutely. I'd love to go. And he's like, well, you need to go ask your mom. So, of course, I went and I asked my mother and my mother said, no, you can't go. It's before dinner. It's a school night and you can't go to the mall. So I went back and I told Kent, Kent, can you please help me out here? Can you convince my mom? Because she says no, but I really want to go. And as we were walking into the living room, he goes, no, you have to do what your mom says. And unless your mom says you can do that, um, there's not a chance. And I said, 
well, that's not fair. And I huffed and I puffed and I stormed down in my room. And when I did, I had said under my breath, when my sister went by, I said, what's wrong? And I said, Kent is an effing fag. Now, my sister, knowing the level amount of soap that would be shoved down my gullet and the beatings that would commence would definitely interrupt her night where she was old enough to go out on a school night and decided not to say anything. But the the true damage of that comment yet to be discovered. That night I went to sleep and of course, uh, all was forgotten shortly after that. And I went into bed and I fell asleep and, oh, I don't know, probably around 1130 at night, the hall light comes on and someone cracks the door in my room. And of course, I'm immediately up and I'm awake and it's my dad. And I could see something was wrong and I knew something was wrong. And as children's intuition develops over the time of growing up and becoming more mature, I recognized that there was a, a real problem here. And as my dad told me and started the story, I, I felt the well in my throat that, that something terrible had happened. And he simply said, Maddie, Kent is dead. And my first reaction being so sleepily is, who? And then it hit me and struck me. And I immediately let that welt in my throat turn to tears. And I can't tell you, that was really my first experience with death. We had lost my great-grandmother beforehand, but but this was was much more palpable, much more real, much, much more... Um, malignant to the soul. And my mother being my mother, who this isn't uh, an attempt to, to just lambast her, but wasn't the very um, most compassionate person, which is now I understand where I get it. But she walked in and said, yep, Kent's dead. And I could see she'd been crying because this was her good friend. And she goes, and he heard you call him an effing fag. I don't know why she said it. I don't understand why she said it, but I didn't understand a lot of the things she said. Although at that time, I felt tremendously horrible. My father explained to me what it meant, and I immediately lamented on using the vernacular and never used the word again until we're talking about it now or when I use it to tell this story, which I have done on occasion. Why the long story? Because despising or using humor to trivialize somebody are two different things. And I will use humor sometimes to challenge the left's ridiculousness. But what I will never do is despise somebody simply because they believe one thing or another. Now, I'm not particularly a huge religious person, even though I, I believe in God and I've read the Bible numerous times and went to church, I serve the Lord in different ways, the best way I know how. And I fail and I succeed at times, I would like to think, but really I won't know until the accounting of, of how I've done. But that also holds true for I've marched in pride parades and I've supported uh, the LGBTQ community through hiring events, through having friends and family, uh, from constantly on the show saying that this isn't an argument with pride. I don't care about pride, so to speak, and the rainbow colored flag and all of that, because inclusivity uh, is a lie. It's not inclusive if it's forced. It happens in the workplace. It happens in the military. It happens in everyday society. And and none of it is real. It's It's as prosthetic as some of the things I mentioned earlier. But there was a very large need for this movement at some point, because even though we may disagree as Christians or, or as just normal everyday people who are heterosexual, you may disagree with the LGBTQ community, and that is your absolute right. You can even make fun of it. You can even use humor to cope with it. You can go ahead and say, I don't appreciate it from a theological point of view. I may not agree with it from a, a matriarch and patriarchal of society point of view. But what you probably shouldn't do, and I can't tell you what to do because you have that right, is despise somebody simply because where they decide to put their penis or where they decide to park their vagina. Simplest way to put it. 
Now, this is why I bring up the 80s and the 90s, all very real, all very important. I had many friends in the military, out of the military, in college, uh, who were homosexual or lesbian, and, and I absolutely agree that pride was essential to allow the, the last form of open prejudice and hatred towards a group of people really remained. And we have been, as I would say, 400 years to move from what happened with African Americans till today, which is progress, which is amazing progress, and anybody who doesn't recognize it is simply crazy, to about 30 years of working towards at least a basis of allowing the LGBTQ community to move towards a place of getting on the path of pursuit to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, that's a very long-winded way. Now, here's the other side. And here's the side where that, that mocking or dry approach to things might come out with less compassion. And I'm going to stay, I hope people stayed. I, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people left and said, I can't stand this. This guy's not a Republican. He's not a Christian. I hope you stayed because I'm going to say this now. To the LGBTQ community, to my hundreds of friends, on my friends list, to Facebook, to people I've worked with at Apple or Comcast or even at Bath and Body Works. Trust me, Bath and Body Works was a lot. You might even be questioning me a little bit. Humor. You crossed a freaking line. And you've been continuing to cross a line that you swore you would never cross. Now, I can say all of those things and be a supporter of pride and LGBTQ people, but not a celebrator, right? I don't have to be a celebrator. I don't have to be someone who goes out there and touts for these experiences and speak from a first person perspective because I don't have that perspective, but I can support you in your pursuit to happiness and life and liberty and not celebrate because honestly, there's no reason for me to celebrate. Going to a pride parade to show support is not celebration. It's me simply supporting. Now, would I go ahead and take my children? Absolutely not. Did I have the opportunity? Yes, and I never would. In fact, that's not their decision to make. It's mine because I'm the parent. And that is the proverbial line in the sand that has been crossed. Let me explain. There's a video of a guy named Harry Sasson. He's a Gen Z type guy. Now, he would call me a boomer even though he's you know 15 years off. I know it's the boyish good looks, but I'm not a boomer, but it doesn't really matter because generational disrespect is inherent in all generations and everyone makes fun of the generation before and after and this is the way it works. Their music always sucks. They don't know how to work. They don't know how to do anything. This is typical and the younger generation says, we don't know anything. We destroyed the world and they have to fix it. That's just the hierarchy of generational nuance and happenstance. But the interesting thing is that Harry Sasson has a very detached reality, but a very large following when it comes to Republicans, conservatives, and people like me. And he wants to espouse things that not only are not true, but horribly damaging to society as a whole. Let me show you what I mean. Let's make something abundantly clear. The Republicans who are attacking President Biden for flying the pride flag outside of the White House are the same Republicans who stayed silent while white supremacist flags were being flown outside of Disney in Florida this weekend. They go after the pride flag, which symbolizes pride in oneself, but stay quiet on the others, which symbolize hate and bigotry. Look, the Republican Party continues to be on the wrong side of history, and that is how we should remember them. Of course, some people just want to get clicks and likes, and this is how he's doing it. He sensationalizes everything. He used to care only about guns, and now, of course, he's moving into this. I, I want to be clear. There has been a, a shift that has taken place, a paradigm shift in the arguments of Christianity oppressing the lesbian and gay community, which is ultimately... Let's be honest, in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of that. Now, you can sit here and say, never. We never did this. stop it, okay? I grew up in the same households you did. I grew up in the same societies you did. I listened from the pulpit like you did and listened from the pews, and I listened to what was being said. Come on, okay? 
we were all told there was an internal damnation waiting for us if we were going to be gay or lesbian. We we know that they were sending people to re-education camp, so to speak, when it comes to beating the mentally, you know, fighting and challenging the demons inside of a person who had homosexual tendencies. Enough. I'm not going to sit here and debate this with you. Once again, if this is where you detach from the show, that's fine. We know that happened. And it may not have been a large supporter of Christians, and it certainly weren't the parishioners. I'm not saying that necessarily. Some were. But there was this heavy push that religious churches and the institution of religion found homosexuality to be a threat to the people sitting in the pews and most importantly having children and keeping the parishioners handing the the basket around, but also embracing things that they considered to be sinful and would be a separation from the good word and ultimately an abandonment of God. Now, I can understand all those things, and I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying that that during that time, that happened quite a bit. We all know this. But something has changed. We were told that this is about love and acceptance and community, and I agree that a lot of it was. But like the waves of first and second wave feminism, which were essential, the burning of the bras, the saying, we want equality, no sexual harassment in the workplace, equal pay, women's rights, the right to vote, suffrage, yes, all of those things. I'm a feminist when it comes to that, and you should be too, especially if you have a daughter or a mom or a grandma or a sister, and we pretty much have all of that guaranteed in our lives, or at least had at one point. We should all be feminists when it comes to that. However, there was another wave of feminism that was pushed by the Saul Alinsky playbook and misogyny and hatred for men, where equality was never really the goal for this group. It was more of how do we take the power away from the patriarch or the man, and how do we give it to the matriarch or the woman and put the men subservient to the situation versus what we've had to deal with? And that, although may sound nice and lovely, and I was willing to accept for some time, is really a bunch of crap and needs to stop. And that is the third and fourth wave of feminism, that men are the enemy. The same thing has now happened with the LGBTQ community. And although Harry Sasan says that every Republican who says this, or what I've said so far, anything up to the point where I said I'm turning the page just a few minutes ago in the show, makes me a homophobe or a transphobe or a Nazi. Now, Every time that there's an injustice in the world, you don't need to go ahead and take credit for it. For instance, January 6th, why Republicans allowed that to be hung over their neck, I never understood. I simply said, that wasn't me. I wasn't there. I don't condone it. I don't support it. End of story. Go give it. Why don't you blame yourself for it? Oh, we're not Trump supporters. Well, I'm a Trump supporter, but that wasn't the definition of what a Trump supporter is. I voted for the other guy. I'm certainly not going to lay my life down for the other guy. The same thing could be said about Nazi flags flying out of Disney. First of all, why do Republicans have to take ownership of this? Of course we condemn. Do we really need to go back? We fought a world war over this, right? We all went to school with skinheads and white supremacist groups. We went to war with the Klan in the 60s and the 70s. Why do we have to pretend that conservatives own this when a very small portion of people who support the Republican movement over the last 50 years are actually racist, Klan members, skinheads, or Nazis? It really is a joke, considering that in the 1960s and 70s, over 600,000 Klan members showed up in Chicago to support the Democratic Party. Let's put it in perspective here. Just because there's people outside of some sort of place, whether it be Disney World or a a, a Kmart, if they even have those anymore, and they're flying Nazi flags, doesn't mean I have to claim these people. Just like I don't have to go to the dog pound and go ahead and claim a sick puppy just because it's there. I can admonish the Nazi flag and Nazism based upon the heritage as a German who is ashamed of his family history and also my great-grandmother who was a Jew who fled Nazi Germany. I don't need to justify that to Harry Sasan or anyone else because I question why a rainbow flag is hanging in the same horizontal presentation as the American flag. This is the line we're talking about. Christians were told you have to take all forms of religion out of school. You have to take it out of textbooks. You can't force people to say the pledge because it says one nation under God. 
We have to question Christmas and say happy holidays instead. We can't force beliefs on people. We have to allow them to go ahead and explore this on their own volition. And this is what's right and mandatory in the separation of church and state. And although Christians hem and hawed for decades, finally agreed and said, yes, we understand that we are an amalgamation of people with ideas and we are going to pull those ideas together versus separating them apart and making people feel ostracized or segmented from something that is supposed to be inclusive, like school, like church, like family gatherings. Okay, fine, we're sold. Took a long time. And we don't want your kids. We don't want to make your kids gay. We don't want, you can't make kids gay. It's a choice, remember? Or it's not a choice. It's it, it's born within you. You were born this way. Remember all those things. And although conservatives, predominantly Republicans and Democrats who didn't support the LGBTQ community in 2012 and before in any way, shape or form, go listen to some of the sound bites from Clinton, Bill and Hillary, Barack Obama, Joe Biden. And it was there was no support for the homosexual community. But there was a promise made of. This isn't going to replace Christianity. This isn't going to be in the schools. We are going to respect that. But what we're asking for is equal rights just to find our happiness, to love who we want, to marry who we want. And I agree with it 120%. And then the shoe dropped. We started to see things that seemed to be a lot of what Christians were being accused of. American flags coming down all over the place. Pride not being simply a recognition of one's inner relationship with themselves and the people around them, but a vocalized piece of conditioning that you had to stand upon the rooftops and shout out or be cast out and castigated against. If you didn't say the right things, if you don't say the right things, if you don't act the right way, you're shunned. You're canceled. You're called a Nazi, a homophobe, a transphobe, an Islamophobe, a deplorable, a racist, a Nazi, a Trump tard, a maggot, or a maggot T as they're calling us now, which is interesting since that's what the Third Reich called Jews, vermin, rats, roaches, maggots. I don't think Christians have a problem with the pride flag. That has been around for a long time and on our product for a long time. And although there may be an inner struggle every time they see it, Christians are pretty good at adapting themselves, considering that they've been persecuted uh, quite a bit throughout history. I think we expected that there would be boundaries that would be respected. But now you see the pride flag flying from Washington, D.C., You're being told that women are no longer women and all you need is lipstick and a dress and women can have babies who are actually men. That we're told that it's impossible to believe the burning bush and the belly of the whale and Mount Sinai and Noah's Ark, but we're somehow supposed to believe that men can have children and that men can be women and that it's not a choice even though people will be gay one day and then choose to be straight the next or be straight most of their life and be gay after. That somehow they're not going after kids because you can't make kids gay because it's actually not a choice. You're born that way. Then why are you marketing to children and using them as poster and billboards if it's who you are and have to be? I think a real conversation is needed. And every single person who I've had in my life who is gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender, I've asked them this question because I really want to know, is it a choice Or are you born this way? And I will tell you the most honest and most consistent answer that I have is it's a little bit of both. I knew at a young age that I was different. And whether I've applied that to myself in recollection and thinking back in yesteryear or it really was true, it was a choice for me. And I have dabbled in all sorts of different relationships to find who I am. I think it's okay to accept that. I think it's okay to accept Christians that they don't have to celebrate what you want to celebrate in order to support you or believe that your cause is righteous. 
But what you're asking for is for you to go against your beliefs. And that's exactly what this is. This movement is based on belief. It's not based on science. It's not based on fact. It's based on you proselytizing that this is now the word. And the answer isn't to replace and condemn Christianity, which we're seeing all the time now that people are bringing up churches and the Catholic church and mixing it with everyday Christians in the United States that somehow all the Christian conservatives are pedophiles. This isn't true. Just like transgender people and gays and lesbian people are not pedophiles. But we're not the ones who are trying to sexualize children. You told us that it wasn't right to tell our children that they had to marry a man or marry a woman based upon their sex, and that having children and procreating and all of that was the normal societal way and theological way to create some sort of Shangri-La or higher level being inside this mortal coil. We listened. And although there are people who condemn homosexuality and condemn Christianity, that's not the greater whole. But when you see, when I walk down Target, I'm seeing shirts about transgenderism. My daughter and son are taking home test papers that have specific questions about who they identify with or if they're transgender or not. And they're being taught these things in school. When we see that a transgender person in Virginia sexually assaults a girl, the, the father was beat up and then she was sexually assaulted again when he went to the Loudoun County School Board and made a stink and was beat up by police for doing so and dragged out, even though they covered it up. We've seen the books that are in the libraries. We don't want to ban books. We want to stop and realize that 100% unfettered access to the internet and YouTube and TikTok and all of these things was something we didn't have. Why should anyone have that? Because there was something that said, you're not old enough. You're not old enough to drink. You're not old enough to vote. You're not old enough to gamble. You're not old enough to drive a car. You're not old enough to buy a gun. You're not old enough to move out. And you're certainly not old enough to talk to me that way. And the day you think you are, let me know and bring your lunch. Remember that conversation with dad? The LGBT community has a responsibility. They have taken and usurped a very high level of responsibility from parents. And they have to take care of this. They have to stop this going on in their own ranks. And I know from my friends and family who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, whatever, agree that what's happening with children and the targeting of children in schools is is not acceptable. It is the opposite side. It's antithetical to the things that the community asked to be stopped when it came to Christian teachings in schools. And now we're going ahead and taking advantage as a transfer of power and doing what you said was so wrong, but simply on the other side of the ideological aisle. I'm calling out both sides here. If you still believe that homosexuality is a sin, you have every right to feel that way. If you believe it's against God's word, you have every right to feel that way. I respect your right to feel that way. But what you don't get to do is go ahead and say that somebody can't live the way their life they want, how they want, without your interference. If you want to express your opinion, you can do it in a respectful manner. And on the other side of that, you need to stop calling people Nazis. You need to stop calling people homophobes and transgender phobes and all of the transphobes and whatever the hell it is. There's so many phobias, but the true thing we're afraid of is we are conversation phobic. We're afraid to talk about this stuff because you're afraid to be canceled. The best thing that I ever did was leave the corporate world. I'm no longer afraid to say what I want. I accept all people, every color, race, creed, sexual disposition. I don't care if you pee sitting up or sitting down. But what I do not want is for you to tell me how to raise my kids. What I don't want is you telling my children that they are white privileged or that they are toxically masculine or that they're going to somehow oppress people because of the teachings that you believe are accurate. We have a responsibility as a communal society to allow people as individuals to express their rights, pursue happiness, 
and demonstrate the liberty that's given naturally and by God to every single American. And anyone who tries to usurp that right from a collective standpoint, through intimidation, through cancel culture, through making people feel small, insignificant, or bullying, you are exactly what you preached against and you have become exactly what you say you don't want. And that is something we both share in common because the LGBTQ community knows what that feels like and now Christians know what it feels like and it doesn't feel damn good at all. And the only people who can do something about it are all of us. Folks, that was a long one. Maybe I should have written something down, but those are my thoughts. It's a big topic. I would love to hear what you think below. Once again, let's try to be respectful. But if you feel you need to call someone a Nazi or you need to call somebody this or that, I promise this. If you go insult everyone, you're going to get banned. And otherwise, I'm open for the conversation. Thanks for watching the Don't Unfriend Me show. My name is Matt Spear. One more time. Thank you for watching. Do me a favor. If you have not had a chance and you like today's show and you want to watch it again some other time, go over to the Don't Unfriend Me show at thedumbshow.com and take a look. We've got all our videos up there. You can buy some cool shirts, some hats, some coffee. Also find our old library of episodes. Or you can go to all social media podcasts at The Dumb Show and you can go ahead and follow us there. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be live tonight in ooh, an hour and 15 minutes. I talked way too long. God bless. Thanks for watching. I will go out like I always do with the Veteran Crisis Hotline. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. I'm David Boreanaz with the Cast the Seal team, and we have an important message for returning vets. We want you to know if you're struggling to cope, there's help and it's just a phone call away. The Veterans Crisis Line is staffed with experienced professionals who know your struggles. There's no greater sacrifice in service to our country. We're able to enjoy our freedoms because of it. Your service is important. You are important. For vets and their families, the Veterans Crisis Line is here to help 24 hours a day. Please call.